What's happening, what's happening, what's happening, good people? You are tuned into the African American folklorist by way of Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Preservation Foundation. Uh, this is a very touching program today because I have a, a legendary guest that I'm honored to be sitting here with. I just want to read a couple of things based on what we're going to be discussing because he has a new project out, <clears throat> an album and a book. Um, for over 50 years, Freeman Vines has transformed materials culled from a forgotten landscape in his relentless pursuit of building a guitar capable of producing a singular tone that has haunted his dreams. Vine's work illuminates the hidden history of black life in the rural South and racial violence that remain today. Let's start right there, sir. Cause there's a lot to unpack right there. The first thing is the fact that how you're making these instruments, or actually not just how, but what is 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 inspiring you or, or, or triggering you to make these instruments. Let's start there. Uh, the sound that I heard uh, years ago, it, it was a strange, it's like, a, it's hard to explain anybody in their experience, but it was not just a sound, it was a feeling too, kind of like when you're holding a tuning fork. But, uh, if I could ever hear that sound again, if that sound could ever be reproduced, you know, uh, what I'm thinking now, a man would be happy just listening at it. It would, uh, it might affect him so bad he listened too much and it would, might kill him because it feels so good. And that sound feels so good. And uh, I ain't never heard it before and never heard it again. Not nothing that will even mimic a duplicate, not need be. And I've tried tuning for special scope, tone chambers and guitars, different types of wood. I've spent a fortune in wood. And uh, it just ain't that no more. I mean, uh, I don't know what it was. I don't know where I had a stroke. I, it's hard to explain. Do you remember when you heard this uh, sound, this tone? Do you remember how long ago it was? It had to be in the late 70s or 80s call. I went through a little stage, there, you know, running around trying to do this and that right there. So many important, but uh, it was somewhere between the early, the early 80s and the late 70s. It's been quite a while, but I was all, uh, I was looking at TV one day and a man was interviewing uh, some people that had uh, experienced not the same sound, but they, they, the way they explained it. It was the same feeling and sound that I experienced. Mm. It, it ain't just something happened to one man. It happened to other people too. Nobody just ain't caught on to it and know who they are. But they was on television and uh, I know right then that they had experienced what I did because uh, it's something you can't make up because it's a feeling. That's right. It, it's most the most extraordinary musical feeling you ever. I know you said blues man. It's the most extraordinary musical feeling you ever had in your life. Like when you strike the right chords in a shot house playing shot house blues, you'll never be able to duplicate the chord in more chord. You don't feel that same way about it. No, that's right. I definitely know that feeling. Now, there's there's another component. I mean, this there's a folklore and ethno ethnographic component as well. But before we get to that, your work is, is is stated by this guardian um 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 um, um statement from on, on your press release that your work illuminates the hidden history of black life in the rural south and racial violence that remain to this day that's a ve that's some strong and powerful work you want to get into that and how that relates to this particular project which hold on actually i didn't even uh properly explain give the name of the project now did i now, it's called the, the 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 book and the album is called hanging tree guitars which is very relevant and important It's relevant to right now but it's also important for the audience to know the name of the project so they can understand the context that we're discussing hanging tree guitars now 
with that being said, please explain the racial component along with uh, the hidden history of black life in the rural South. <laughs> well, when I got uh, over there in Green County where I grew up, that was a bad, bad place. And uh, at the time, that when I was real young, you know, back in the uh, late 40s and early 50s, a man didn't hardly come out of the neighborhood. He only knew the, uh, the store he went to to do what they called, well, not the man, I'm talking uh, from the view of a child. The store that, that folks went to to uh, do what they call trading, they give you a little piece of, uh, a, l- a little thing like a, uh, it's cardboard by that wide and by like that, then they clip it out, then no money. On this road we lived on, it was a plant see my plantation, the real plantation right there on the highway. We were on the highway then dirt road. But uh they were the families that lived down that road. One car was in the neighborhood, a man named Nick Dix. He wouldn't let you ride on it because the car won't much to the car. But uh that was a bad place. And when I come over here, and started messing around, buying wood here and there, still experimenting with the sound the man sold me the wood, he told me. And I really, I don't know where he know he was going to die of what, because he told me, he said, you might not want that wood there. I said, why? He, he wasn't 91, he died at 91. He said, uh, they hung a man on that tree. I mm. didn't even believe it. Had the wood and laid it in the bone. Here come Tim trolling around. What are you going to do with that wood there? I know there was something strange about that wood, but I hadn't figured it out. Uh, so I'm going to make some guitars sooner or later. So then I got to thinking about it and made a few. And I know it's messing with that wood there. There was something supernatural about it, but I kept on doing it because at that time I was taking a sip. And uh, messed around there and he came back with uh, all the papers, did this and that right there that verified what the man had said about the tree. Well, not what the man said about the tree, about the hanging. Mm. And years and years went by. Uh, Tim found out that everything that was uh, about that tree was true because he went and he found a woman whose uh, granddaddy was in that stuff and uh, she told him a whole lot of stuff, which I told him I didn't want to hear I said, I want to hear it because I got to stay around here and you see us sneaking pig around here. Mm-hmm. So uh, he kept digging and digging and digging and, and he came up with names. And I said, Tim, I, I don't want to hear no more, man. So uh, <laughs> this morning, this same morning, I was out there and the guy walked up to me. He said, You that cat who wrote that book? I said, Yeah. He said, I know that guy where you, uh, you wrote the book about. In that hanging tree, I said, "No, he said, yeah, I do." They had a brother named William Earl. He had one named George. He named uh, several people that had scattered around. But see, the family had to disperse on kind of what had happened right here. They had to leave. I mean, on the land, they had no choice. Mm. And uh, he said, "Know what?" I said, "What?" He said, "My wife and their cousin too." I said, "You serious?" He said, "You wouldn't never know it because she used my last name." And I said, dang, that tree has brought on a lot of stuff in it. And, and it, it, I don't know what it's doing, but it's doing something to me. Mm. And, and know that the man told the truth. How many people tell you the truth? Yeah. And he, <laughs> told the truth. he sure told the truth about it. So now, just for clarification, when you say Tim, are you talking about Tim Duffy? Tim Duffy. Of uh, Music Maker Relief. Music Maker Relief. He spent a lot of time on the road running here and there. And tell me he ain't hung out with some clucks to find out uh, the specific stuff. But I don't to know that, you know. As in Ku Klux Klan? Right. Wow. So he... <laughs> now, that this is street talk now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This ain't nothing he said. But the homeboys wait, call themselves in on it. All they doing is talking around other people. You know, you can tell a whole lot of lies talking around homeboys in the project, especially if you got a lucid to give them. <laughs> That's another folklore right there that we can get into another time. So 
what it sounds like it's saying for the audience is that this this wood you got from this tree was a tree that was historic for for the lynching of black folk and and as you you you're making these guitars you're finding out information about the truth of or, or, or the merit the val- uh, validity of this and it turns out to be true so now is is i want to ask you the are the tones singing to the spirit? Are, are you feeling the, the ancestors? The seven and nine are strange, you would ask that. The seven that were leading me on to keep that on, talking to folks about it, you know that I trust, well, I trust you, other oh, folks, I kind of leave this alone. Mm-hmm. But uh, the seven about that would, that's us. I don't know if it was supernatural, I have no idea what it would, but. When uh, I completed some stuff and these some these some figures in that wood that I don't know what put it there. Mm. It wasn't my whittling and carving. It was just the uh, shaping it like an instrument and which sometimes the saw would even, man, the saw would act erratic. I couldn't even make it do what I wanted to do. Mm. And then when it get through with it and I throw it aside, uh, here we go again. Him, he come by, he said, oh, that one right there. I said, that's a funny looking one there and everything. I wouldn't even know that it had uh, produced the shape of an instrument until I take it up and look at it. I said, show sure you. Scraping it off and stuff, man, you would be surprised at what you discovered. Well, we know that this tree was disfigured from uh, probably shooting and hitting with hammers and stuff, but it all led up to something. Mm. So how many guitars were you able to make from that one particular tree? I have no idea because when you come to load them up, man, I was so ready for them to go away from that car. You know, I used to practice black magic, and I know that there's some, there's another world that's parallel to this one called. I mess around with Yvonne and David Frost and went in a trance, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know how I know that, but when I look back, there was a a silver three it looked like silver, but what it was, it, it looked like some light or something other that but had me hooked up to something other back on the other side. Mm. So in, in this state, I know that if I break that thread, I won't get back. So I got scared and come back and everything. You know, David and his wife told me, said, we had trouble getting you out in the tramp, man. So we don't think we want you to, to be in the magic circle no more. Mm. You know? And this is what led me led me to know that that supernatural stuff is something to it. it it's not a joke. It's no, not it's joke. not. You know what I done then? I go to an old man, and uh, I asked him some questions. I said, "Look, I said, you believe in uh, black magic, voodoo, and stuff?" He said, "No." He said, "But I believe in something that can be done that we can't explain how it be done." He said. Let me give you two examples, and then I don't hear no more about it. He said, people used to him it was real bad, bad on their nose, busted blood vessel stuff, said they would go get the old woman in the neighborhood to uh, do what it called stopping the blue. He said, there have been incidents where people had burns, where now they take them up to the hospital and they die from that the folk are talking to fire. Mm. And he said, no, I'm going to leave that alone, so don't ask me nothing else about it. <laughs> I think the old man is 90 years old now. So let me, I have to ask you this, these experiences with uh, black magic, voodoo, and this gentleman, are these uh, black folk or white folk? Now this year was surprising. David and Yvonne Frost were white. But uh, Dale Zora Petty for Diana to all. Uh, Belle Haven, she was black. Harry Peterson was black. And uh, Ross Putin, he was white. And uh, I can't think of the woman name up young the Monroe up there by Federal. Uh, I believe she was white. We we corresponded on the telephone. I don't know where. I can't think of her name. But uh, and Dr. Buzzer, he was black. And then there was uh, Papa John or Papa Joe or somebody. He was a Jamaican or Haitian or voodoo person, and uh, he was black. But these two, these, these people had a bad reputation of uh, David Nebel and Frost because they practiced attack the magic way or uh, they believed in hurting people. Mm. Now, 
Del Zoro, and uh, I forgot that most renowned witch they ever been. I don't know where she was black, mixed, uh, Cajun or Creole, uh, was uh, yeah, Marie Le Beau. Mm. She was down in Louisiana, you know. Yeah, I, I know a lot about Louisiana. <laughs> so let me ask you, was, was is that was was is that part of the 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 hanging tree project, or is this just different aspects of your journey be, uh, as as a black southerner? Well, that's a, that's uh, all that's in the journey, as if you're passing buildings and stuff, you're passing these points and laugh, you know. And somewhere down the line, somebody come back to you to help you, and somebody don't. Now, the bad stuff, I try to put that aside, but uh, somebody to come back and embellish what you're trying to do or know or thinking about, and that's the way it works. It's something spiritual. And would you, so do you believe the, the supernatural in regards to, um, God or black magic is is what you're you're experiencing when you were creating these instruments from this tree. I think it was some of both. Cause uh, it came back to me what happened when uh, the snake incidents in in the uh, in the Bible that old old elder person preached about that time that uh, everything God does, Satan he mimics it. And God gave him the privilege to do it. So he uh, referred to an incident of Simon's Magus and somebody else that uh, done some snake stuff. And then the uh, God man snake it, the uh, it Satan man snakes up and stuff. So Simon Magus was going to fly. So he went up high enough. And then uh, Satan let him alone and he fell down and died. But uh, I always look at it as some good and some bad. I try to stay away from the bad cause, you know, there ain't no turning back once you stop reading. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so do you think uh, you were led by a spirit or the spirit to that particular wood? Because it's connect. you know, you hear the, you hear this tone, then you go to, to get some wood and, and you're led to a specific wood and then you're finding out these stories, and it's all kind of uh, uh, um, wrapped around supernatural and 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 sacrifice, right? Because lynchings are, are, are ritualistic sacrifices of black bodies. So, do you, do you think this you were led to that for a purpose? I believe all in it, some way or another. Way before I even thought about, you know, other things and everything. I think all of it were linked together. It just, I just hadn't got to that link in the chain of events. And all of it was, was set right that way. Because better shape is on me, and I suppose them kicked the bucket a long time ago. Mm. But uh, they are uh, all in it linked up. And like I said this morning, the link, another link came in the chain, but I don't even know where my tell Tim or not, because, man, he'll get excited, and he'll be looking for them folks. Well, so let me ask you, because in your um, in in the research I did about you, it's suggested that you're a spiritual philosopher, which we're getting a piece of that. Um, did someone give you that moniker, that title? Did you say, I am a spiritual philosopher, or just based on how you express and receive information, uh, it, this is uh, people just understood that that's you, who you are? Well, I think more or less is people understood that see called uh, the a lot of stuff, I don't know how I know because of. Uh, I only, <laughs> I only have a third grade education. I learned how to read and write in the penitentiary. Mm. So, after three years of, well, not three years, off and on in the school, see, my mother, she had a little problem. She wanted to be Honest John, housewoman. I didn't feel playing music with a dress on, and the board, man, they just made a fool at me, laughing at me. Young old Miss Avery, look at her. She she be she be doing what the best she could so we could have somewhere to live and somewhere to eat a little stuff. But uh, I think spiritually something else happened to me. I, I I have no idea. But if some things come to me, I don't suppose enough. 
like uh, a whole lot of them folks, Ross Putin and uh, Madame Blavatsky and them, those are witches and warlocks that the people did, they have forgot about. The only reason they uh, know about them is uh, they have to go get some old books. Like, uh, how did I know that Kendall wrote a Bible and everything? Mm. How did I know about all? I don't know how I know it. Mm-hmm. Now, on on a plantation that you came up on, the two questions I would like to, for you to answer is, one, were you playing blues and instruments then? And two, were, were, were you aware of the spiritual element and the, and the black magic that surrounded the town? Well, that's the strangest thing in the world. He, he had to have been a demon. He was no white guy over there. All the time, every time you saw him, he had a shotgun or a fishing pole. He was either hunting or fishing. Mm. He had a little farm down there he rented out. And one day he come by there, he said, boy, I said, come in and talk my damn fishing pole for me. I'm going to the stuff. I was scared to not do it, scared to do it. So hung out with him, went to the stuff, had some jawbone breaking, drunk, a 16-ounce double cold. I would have his head then. <laughs> but on the way back home, <laughs> I know what was going to happen. So once she was coming to met us coming down from Midra House, she said, uh, where you been, boy? Did I tell you to go anywhere? Oh, he been there. no no white man. I think he got back drunk then. Oh, he been out down to the store with me. When uh he went on down the road and went on to the house, she said, You know what? She said, that white man go get you killed. She said, But I'm gonna kill you before he does. <laughs> he went down around there, got the yard broom and took a damn dog with a switch out there. Mm. Here that man come again for that week ago. And then by and by, he went to that old house way they had back there. It was made out of nothing. I read logs and stuff. I have no idea now because I was scared to go in there. But anyway, he went in there and he got an old guitar. He playing Yoda, Taddy, by this and that right there. I said, let me play something. He said, no, you ain't ready yet. So by and by, he taught me a tune called Wildwood Flower. I went to the shot house down there playing Wildwood Flower. Me and folks were laying all on the floor beating the floor. <laughs> they said, look at that song of gun that playing here, Billy. He, <laughs> he was blue men now. I'm talking blue men that went in the northern states and became a semi famous. Mm. So I kept right on and on. I'm getting some age on me. Then I could take the whooping then. And, uh, he said, if you were able to learn how to play that wildwood flower, he said, you'll be all right. So finally, I learned how to play. I was sitting over there at Mr. John and May House, and uh, everybody eating and drink. You drink, boy, I said, no, he ain't no drink now. By and by, I listened at that song for y'all. Uh, was a uh, stoop down baby, stoop down and let your daddy see and I was uh, listening that that song and comparing it with Wildwood Flower, except the Wildwood Flower was slowed down and started off in a minor key instead of a major key. Mm. <clears throat> I said, I can play that right there. He had called me, so you can't play nothing. Boy, he'll be the stuff. Give me a guitar. We will whoop his ass if he get in here playing he'll be the word to say. The woman started singing the song by Stoop Down Baby, messed up three or four times. She she got one more time, boy. With mm. stuff and everything flying right in my face, talking right in my eyes. She said, she started off again, Stoop Down Baby, Stoop Down and let your daddy see. I got it right that time. I had it all <laughs> right. That's why I started feeling good playing the music, man. And good God of mine. From then on, it was on. And I was set out there and uh I said to myself, I'm going to sneak up there and steal that guitar. I said, so now you do that. So you see what they've done to Mr. Black down the road down there. But by and by, I had it. And all the stuff that I added on, took away, and embellished were from that same song that man learned me about the Wildwood Flower. Mm. All the chords and everything in there, you just had to rearrange them to fit what they're supposed to do. My sister went to the top on gospel music off of my off of that same. They don't know it. Though. That same song where I showed the guitar play. Mm. Same thing. Same music when Bellish and me were in there, the divine sister. So oh wow. Okay. So let me ask, how long have you been making your own guitars? Good God almighty. I, I talked to my daughter about that because one year I snapped a little bit and uh 
little wine problem. I had to go up yonder and get my brain straight. She said it had to be about 50. She 54. Um, I think she's 54 years old. She claims she's 33. <laughs> but uh, she said that uh, it had to be around 50 or 51 years. Mm. So now, this is interesting. Who taught you how to make your own instruments or, you know, what what inspired that? Well, I wanted a guitar then, but uh, see, there been a day when around him, uh, if a man having to buy a Stella with a warp neck on it or beat up, you know, something the white guy didn't want to buy and everything, man, he was a happy camper. Mm. And uh, I just kept around. I said, I believe I can make one, but it, it won't be easy as I thought it would to put some strings on a piece of wood, you know, and getting it without a pickup. So out of why folks start there, uh, several tones and several guitars and stuff like that. I right that get get taught them. You could take the pickups and the controls off, and I could put them on me a block of wood like I wanted to. Everything more right, but you know, and that's the way it started. So in the years past, I got to the place I learned a little more about it, but I still uh, were not the blue man like Mud said that time we were up in Chicago. Me and Cecil had. He said, you're pretty good, he said, but you'll never make it. He said, the only man going to make it, hand that microphone. He said, you get behind that microphone, he said, you better off. And at that time, I thought about it, he was right. Because the musician then that went, the blue musician that played for the blue men went and go, went and go, you know, he know who they were. A whole lot of them. Mm. Mm. So he was telling you that you got to sing too? Well, now you got to expose, at this time, this has been quite a while ago now, uh, you had to expose yourself so somebody would know who you were. You take Jimmy Reed, he was in front of the mic. Muddy Waters, he was in front of the mic. John Lee Hooker, he was in front of the mic. Byron Ray, she was in front of the mic. Chuck Barry, he was in front of the microphone. Never even know who the backup men were who had played for Chuck Barry. Oh, they, they, they just won't stop him. All they were looking at was him doing a duck walk and sing. <laughs> and like the gospel group, the reason they exposed their musicians and everything and all like that, they want folks to know who they is and who doing what's what. Mm, mm. So did you grow up in church? I went to church and a few beatings about that too, because Mark Klain told me, oh, I forgot how she said it, but anyway, you had to go to church. The girls had to go. They specifically had to go. Mm-hmm. Man, she get them on the Right down the dirt road, be walking to church. One snatched one over there wood and beat the hell out of it. <laughs> I mean, the girls, they had to go. So then they started singing in the choir and everything. And the old man, he got sober long enough, heard about it. He said, uh, y'all making fools of yourself. Nobody ever know that he sung in a group. Mm. Nobody ever know. But anyway, he took them and taught them the uh, alto soprano, that good John Brown harmony. Oh, he can't come out there. He taught him. He knew what music was supposed to sound like. But anyway, they went on and did gospel music and used the name of the Vine Sisters. And they've been to a, they've been all over the John Brown gospel search. They sung with everybody on everybody on the gospel search. Mm. They. Special guests for the blind boys of Mississippi, blind boys of Alabama, special guests out in Tyler, Texas, Willie Neal Johnson. They've been around, man. So do you, um, did your did your father pursue it uh, professionally? It sounds like he did. He was in a group. Yeah, he was in a group, say, but uh, my, my daddy and his brothers, they love what they call sweet Lucy, which was wine. And they found out they'd be in church drinking and stuff. And now, this was after then that I heard about that. Yeah, you'd be in there taking a sip and smell like wine and stuff. And folks thought they didn't have music then. They sung mm-hmm. harmony. And uh, I can't think of the, who they, their favorite group was. Uh, Could have been not true, but anyway, somebody told me. Yeah, they did it. They tried to do it and everything. I tell you one song they sung. Uh, that was a beautiful song, and I can't see why they didn't pursue that because uh, the Mill Brothers had already recorded a song with a paper doll. Mm. You know, the uh, hymn, Uncle yes, sir. Buck, hit my daddy, Uncle Buck, Uncle Baby, and Uncle Benson, they had the harmony just like the Mill Brothers. 
I'm going to buy a paper daughter I can call my own. So, well, it, it sounds like music is generational in your family. Yeah, it was. And, uh, but like I said, them guys, man, uh, all of them, every one of them died from uh, uh, fibrosis. Uh, it what wine do to your liver. They didn't live long. Mm. I don't think never made it to 70, but Uncle Al and uh, how he did it, I don't know. Because, you know, there was a mixed group there. There was some of them too white to be black and too black to be white. Mm. And some of them were black enough to be black. So mm. nobody knows what was going on because you couldn't ask old people no questions then. Right. When you got old enough to ask them, they were dead. Because my grandmother, you know, she was white. Was she? Yeah. Mm. So you come from a mixed background. How was that on a plantation life? Well, see, they took Grandmammy Flo in. Uh, she wasn't there. She came from that place over there where the people was uh, real light brown. Uh, they captured them and brought them over here with the Africa and stuff. So old master, he saw her and she looked pretty good to him and put her in the house. She was a housewoman up uh, there having children. And uh, you know that uh, the old mistress had to know that that man was getting them children because she won't go nowhere. They had she stayed in the slave quarters back then, mm. unless the woman was a pure fool. They coming out there with it like all. Uh, my sister went back in the generation so bad, I got scared. We moved away, away from all uh, where we were then to another. Then they didn't have sense to move out of the country. Mm. Just trading houses. Uh, babe, see, when Babe was born, she was a blonde. Her mm. hair was blonde and straight. And folks were talking about more like a dog. I took a whole lot of ass whoopings on kind of trying to defend that more dealing with them white guys around there. Mm. Mm. Man, so what brought on this particular project we're coming back to the project for a moment because you have such a uh, a rich uh f life history but i want to get back to the project for a moment what what inspires you to actually make this a record in a book the the, well, the, the book was so somebody would know what's going on about the guitar and, and this right here with the book and the wood for the guitar, everything that was uh, I seen to prove that it was true by the tree, just making the instruments out of the tree saying, yo, a, a dude, a hundred a tree, man. I figured that wasn't good enough. The people had to have substantial evidence that were interesting enough to say, yeah, this guitar hand came off in that tree that uh, the man was hung on. They could say, look back and say, yes, yeah, so it's, it's true that that happened and everything. And uh, instead of being a liar out there trying to make people feel sorry for me or, uh, you know, stuff like that. Right. Trying to condescend you, but you know what's going on. Right. And they'll know, too, because all they got to do is get on their thing and, uh, and, and find out what the deal is. And they'll find out it's true. I ain't never like to be a liar. The warden told me, he said, the two kind of men don't survive in here. A faggot and a liar. Mm. That's what he said. I walked through the door. I told a whole lot of black eyed, bloody nose, and swole heads, but I can't. I went in there, boy. I came out a man, straight. All right. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, where where did you serve the time, and were you able to play any music in there? Yeah, they gave you all. First, I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and I did a little something in there. And then for orientation and admission to another uh, penitentiary, that was uh, <clears throat> kind of rough. They from uh, there from Cali from Atlanta, Georgia, went to Tallahassee for orientation and admission, and from there to Rayford, Florida, down there in that rough place. And uh, that's where I did the rest of the time at. But uh, it was my own fault because all I had done was snitch on the guys, and I know not to do that. Mm. See, they're in a prison like Atlanta, Georgia, and everything. You snitch on somebody, you threw. They walk right behind you, stick a knife right in your back. Keep your mm. mouth shut, tote the damn whoopings, and, and uh, try to live with it. I see what the guy done to the guy. I looked right at him. I was laying down on the bottom of the bunk, but I pretended I was asleep. 
Mm. And they knew that I know what had happened because, see, this guy was on the top bunk. They made the roll call the next morning, and he didn't get up. And uh, after everything, they went in there and did this and that right there. They said, 23, 5, 6, to 7, go to the warden's office. I knew they were going to do it. But I won't buy the John Brown getting in there and tell nothing on nobody. I didn't know why, what happened to him, and I just went on to my time and left. Mm. So I know you got a good few blues songs out of those uh, experiences. Yeah, I've done some blues and, and stuff and uh, all, but it never mattered to nothing because you take uh, bad situations, then uh, well, you, and then you got to be poetic to make stuff rhyme and stuff. So you find out that just because you got a few words to put on something that don't work. Those people write them songs, they know how to make them rhyme. They know how to uh, long it's supposed to be for you, chain tunes and stuff. There's a little more to writing a song than people think it is. Hmm. So considering your musical background, um, do, were you taught songwriting from from either your family or the gentleman that taught you how to play guitar? No, uh, my sister, folks said she was gifted. Sis, well, well she ain't got no scent now because she had a stroke. <clears throat> Sis, Bay, and Bea, they uh, they wrote a lot of songs. Some of them now they playing on the radio. I uh, wrote like Road and Ready and uh. Boo Boo, she wrote that song. And uh, a whole lot of them, they playing now, other folks singing and this and that right there. But I know the song because I heard them messing with them on the front porch and out of the yard and stuff. But it don't do no good if you ain't got your work in order. They, uh, well, you can't do nothing. You can't stop them by from singing the song they like. Right. Right. You could just uh, hopefully. Uh, nobody's showing me how to write now. I'm going to call it would just come to me and everything. And then and I get to playing it, I couldn't make it rhyme. And it just won't write. There's just something to it you had to know that I don't know. So you mentioned when you were giving us your family history and how it became uh, multiracial, uh, excuse me, multi, uh, a multi rate. I don't think I said the word right, but uh, multi-racial, uh, there it is, um, that on the plantation. So your family has been on our plantation since the slave days. Probably had, but uh, you see, uh, I imagine they had, called, see, uh, it began that, uh, I, and this is strange to me. Now, on my daddy's side, his great grandmother, maybe grandmother, yeah, great grandmother, grandmother Florine, she was a housewoman. Now, on my mother's side, her daddy was a houseman. Mm. He done the cooking, the washing, and uh, now this is before he got married. This is before he got married when he was a boy, and I read they had just uh, freedom, or maybe they hadn't freedom because he worked at that Mr. Norville's house at the uh, I forget what they call the boys then, where you know, wash the clothes, pump the wash pot, and stuff the sausage. And they had certain tasks that they would have a man kind of hanging around their family to do. And Paul, he done that right there. He learned a few skills and stuff. But uh, that's what was odd about it. Uh, he was a houseboy, I named him that myself. Mm. And uh, Grandmammy Flo in with a housewoman. I don't think she never worked in the field. Mm. But her children did not. Okay. Okay. Uh, have you we have you ever worked in the field? Man, did I? <laughs> Lord have much cause see the old man by him being never white with his uh they call it curly hair and <clears throat> women claim he was pretty. He didn't think he had to work. So they go rent farms and stuff and then more this was Ed I got old enough to know what work was. More she would uh do all that right there. And in order for people to not say she was a fool, she would hide the fact that he didn't want to work. Mm. So do you. Me and her have been out there in the field, man, breaking cone when your hands were numb. I said, more. I said, uh, 
Don't no, no, ask me nothing about that man, she said. Do my hooks. That was her favorite word. Mm. So how, how, how does it how, how how do you feel growing up around this understanding uh 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 the, the plantation life, Jim Crow, and how black folk is treated. And then in this day and age, which a lot of people believe is so far removed, but as you and I are discussing now, is not as quite as far removed as a lot of people portray. How do you feel when you're seeing all, all, um, all of these, you know, the Black Lives Matter, uh, black folk being killed in the street, whether it's by each other or the cops, all these things that you're seeing uh, in today's world, knowing that it's not so far removed from how you was raised. But the thing about it is it ain't removed at all. None at all. All it had done, they have blinded the black man to that. And uh, that's why he kills each other and everything, and then he get out there and make a few fool on himself to uh, march up and down the streets and stuff. The first thing you got to do, <clears throat> if you take care of a problem, I learned this from Malcolm X, if you take care of a problem, you got to go where the problem at. You can't, the man sitting over yonder, way over yonder somewhere, and you way over him burning up stuff, ain't having the problem. You got to go where the problem at. Mm. You work better solve, but you cannot solve a problem. I can't solve that problem now with you, where you at, and I'm here burning down these folks' souls and stuff and hooting my hollering enough and down the street. It don't make sense. And killing each other like that right there, and then getting on TV, claiming they love each other so good because the policeman shot one. Oh Lord, I love him. He was a nice guy. They get out there and kill one the next night and everything. Oh, you know, uh, John shot Joe the other night. Oh, shoot, I've been looking for that. Mm. There ain't no different. The man see a day. But if you got a problem, a racial problem, go where it begun at. Burning down stones and stuff ain't solving no problem. And it ain't making it no better. Mm. None. So I have to ask you this, again, considering that you come from the cloth with firsthand information, not six, seven hand information that a lot of um, people like to toss around. What do you feel about this statement? There's no black, there's no white, there's just blues. Does that um, remove the, the, the black history and struggle from the black expression? No, because uh, they, they're talking, there ain't no blue, see. The reason they know, the reason the person say that is because they ain't never suffered no bad consequence. Hey, you right now, I noticed you chunked a little blue stuff in there in your background a while ago. You know what blues is. I do, sir. So a man playing blues, you got that blue feeling. If he clowning out there with some of the rock you claim he playing the blues, you can say he ain't playing no blues. Because number one, a blues man, he plays alone. He, and what he doing is himself. <laughs> he expressing himself when he's singing the blues. Like a, a whole hey big boss man. Jimmy Reed really, he meant what he was saying. Blues, and, and a lot of that stuff they call blues ain't blue. Mm. The guy down south down there, when I went through there on that uh, minute chilling circuit, them John Brown, there was a hard blue men. They played in what down there, what they call juke joints. Up here, they call them shot house. And them guys get in there, and I'm talking, they were serious. The ladies that sung and the men that played, they were serious. Mm. One man could take an instrument and play all his music. Now you got to have a whole band to play. So I look at it as it's not being blue. Them guys were, were saying and playing, they lied. What they had experienced, what they've been treated. Well, I, this may be a little redundant because you just answered it, but I, I would kind of like to ask it to you specifically. What is the blues? The blues to me. Like say for instance, you are, to me now, my experience, you go somewhere, everybody melancholy and everything, here come a man with an old guitar. He start to play a little something, now you already say it. 
Don't work out a week. You got about 10 cents in your pocket and nothing. Everybody in there supposed to be having fun and nothing. And here comes the old blue man. And he's so a bit and everything, brings a little joy, getting to drinking, doing this and that right there. And after a while, you sure enough got the blue. You start thinking about all the bad things happened to you and the bad things been done to you. You couldn't do nothing about it. It's a bad situation to be in. A blues man really ain't got no lifestyle. He's not a happy person. Mm. And the get talk makes it even worse because sometimes you find a man that really hooked up in them daggone blues, he make that instrument and everybody express itself. The way I've seen it, oh, yonder to uh, Johnny Mays happened. It was different in different places. We went a guy playing a little gospel, music, a little electric guitar, doing this and that right there. But a real blue man, he is a blue man. Mm. I hear that. Well, now with with a lot of the the things you've made with the, well, let me rephrase that. Besides guitars, what else have you made from this wood? Okay. I had a piece of, I reckon it was two before laying on the porch. Man came by and there was a knot on that. And I did, I was, I was going to throw the wood away till he asked for it. One of the And then all of a sudden, I, I was sitting there in the eddy left and I got my wooden mallet and beating the knot. I feel the bottom part of a shoe. I kept beating it. Here coming. All I done was glued it together like that, and it was a shoe. Even had little knots where it looked like strange stuff. I couldn't understand it. I mean, I, I had to get out of that and get that stuff away from me. <laughs> you know, I just never understood how the knot came out. Well, it was an oblong knot now. Oblong knot shaped like that, and then some more that went on top of it. But when I got it glued together and took the brush and brushed off all the debris and stuff, it was shaped just like a shoe. Mm. And you can look right at it and tell it ain't been whittled and carved. It came out in that block of wood like that. So, in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in some cases, you don't set out to make something specific, but yet again, you just follow where the spirit is taking you. You got it right there. I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't explain it, not a bit better. Follow it where the spirit takes. Cause you ain't got no choice when you're working with hand tools and stuff. Cause you can't take advantage of it like they do with the uh, the computerized machine. Now. Like I said, that saw it do funny things, but nobody don't believe it in their experiences. But uh, once you ever start to looking at what they have done, it really don't make you do it. It's just that it seems like it travel on itself. It's hard to explain. I invited people to come and uh, experience that on that wood, but nobody never came. So you asked people to to come, and are we talking about the lynching tree wood or just any wood? The lynching tree wood. Mm. So you, you you asked people to come take part in trying to make something out of it, but they were a little scared. They didn't want nothing to do with it. Mm. They didn't want nothing to do with it because of, as you said a while ago, spiritually, I probably would led to the wood and didn't know it, never accepted it, and uh, just wanted to do it my way, and it didn't work that way. It wasn't intended to be that way. And the book of life, it was the way it's supposed to be, and that's the way it was. No, I, I, I hear you, man. And I mean, I'm, I'm really honored that we spent this time. Uh, I want to ask you what, what, besides, um, the story and the actual uh, instruments and things that you've made, what else do you want people to receive from this project? Black, white, everybody. I want everybody to grasp something out there that uh, musically or uh, just looking at the designs that were in the wood and all. Uh, I really are. Uh, when I went down to the museum to look at it, it was totally different feeling the hard to explain call. I ain't figured out what kind of feeling it was yet. But there's something about that wood that complements music, sadness, and everything. I mean, it's hard to explain how it is, but uh, that's the way it is. 
But the other wood and everything, it's got some nice guitars and stuff, but that that that's some strange wood. If you ever get a chance to come down and uh, and mess with one of them, you're gonna find out. No, I, I I definitely am very interested, but I'm coming with 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 the most high. Uh, <laughs> how they say the uh, the prayer warriors. <laughs> I don't think there's nothing, okay, nothing uh, uh, about witchcraft in the wood and everything, uh, but uh, then you never know, because uh, there was a lot of demonized people down there, you know, participating in that killing. Exactly. It was a man that died down there. It mm. wasn't an animal. It was a man. Some way or another, I think spiritually, I won't plan on saying anybody. about that. I think spiritually, he wanted somebody to know that he hadn't did that. Mm. He said he begged for his life, real pitiful and everything. And uh, after he uh, had to deal what he did, said uh, he, uh, one of the men wanted to said, "Let's dig him up and see that he have gonorrhea." Mm. They wouldn't do that. All right, I don't think they never find out what he buried him at. There's so many stories to unpack from this wood, and and I mean. It, it, folks, you need to look into this one and two. Uh, I guess I need to ask you: Is there going to be a follow-up book if they if they find the body and all these other things? I imagine they will. It, you know, it, it depends on how I be inspired. Right again, being led by the spirit. Led by the spirit. You got it now. I hear you. Well, Mr. Vines, I, I appreciate your time, sir. And uh, I, I do plan on speaking to you again real soon. I sure hope you do. <laughs> I do. I thank you, sir. And for you, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this project, the description and links will be in the description box. So as you know, what we do here, we celebrate heritage, preserve heritage, and we talk about the blues and we talk about African-American folklore, ethnography, and ethnomusicology. And you've just been blessed with all of the above. So now you see and hear that all these things are related and you got it directly from a firsthand source. Thank you all much. Uh, Joe, thank you.